Welcome to Island Baptist Church. Today's sermon is in Luke 6, Blessed and Cursed. Luke chapter 6, we are uh, there finishing up. We finished up last time with uh, the apostle uh, Judas and looking at the 12 apostles and spent quite a bit of time together. That was my first time to study those guys. I don't know if it was for y'all. I have never really considered them, but when I started looking into them and how important they were, it's like we just can't just skip over these these people. We need, I knew their names. I mean, I was raised in the Baptist church. They made us learn their names, but what else did I know about them? Nothing. So, so, uh, which was, which is sort of a shame. So we're going to be together here in Luke chapter six, and we're going to be beginning there in verse 20. And so we've switched from listening or looking at the apostles. We're going right straight into, the text goes right straight into one of the better, better known teachings of Jesus, which are the Beatitudes. And they're recording in several places in, uh, in the New Testament, most extensively, in the book of Matthew, and we're going to find there's going to be some, as we handle these Beatitudes, Matthew and and Luke are, uh, they have some differences in the way that they record them, and some people say, oh, well, there's a contradiction in the scriptures, therefore it must not be accurate, and all this crazy stuff, and explanation actually is pretty simple. Uh, Here's, for instance, Matthew records a whole lot more. He, He records the Beatitudes in a in a conglomerate that we call the Sermon on the Mount, if you're familiar with that. And, uh, but the whole Sermon on the Mount, as it's recorded by Matthew, Matthew obviously, or if you think about it, would record more than anyone else, uh, just simply because his job was to write stuff down. As, as a tax collector, you had to be proficient in shorthand in several languages. So it's not really a shock that he was able to record more because it's sort of the way he, his, his mind worked that way. And like I said, he was a thug, but he was also uh, he had to keep records for the Roman government, even though he probably fudged those things in, in his lifetime. But nonetheless, it, it shouldn't surprise us that he writes down more, but what he writes down in the Sermon on the Mount is only ten and a half minutes. So let me ask you a question. Jesus only pre- preaches for ten and a half minutes? I'm thinking no. Now, he's better than me, obviously. It takes me longer to say the same thing, but, uh, you know, that's an age... You know, you, today they, they teach us as, as preachers to only preach 30 minutes, and I know, you know, you're going to raise a red flag, Pastor, we went over last Sunday, and I know that. Um, but, but we live in a day in which people are used to sound bites and microwave society, and you can only pe- hold people's attention so long, and Jesus was in a day when people didn't have that issue. They had nothing else to do. Plus, Jesus is the best speaker that there ever was. So if he preached for an hour and a half, nobody would care. He might have preached for two or three or four hours. So, so, so what we have in Matthew and what we have in Luke is basically a um, congealed version of what Jesus actually said, just excerpts actually from the actual sermon. So it shouldn't surprise us that what Matthew has to say and what Luke has to say is somewhat different because I can tell you as a speaker and as a preacher, and you're going to hear me do it today, we repeat ourselves because what's our purpose? that you learn, that we communicate, and people learn and listen the same way as they always have. And so uh, unlikely that Jesus just spoke for 10 and a half half minutes, very, very unlikely. And during that sermon, I would suggest to you that he restated himself several times and remade the case in several different angles and from several different facets. And in that process, we have what we have here in Luke as compared to what we have here in Matthew. What would happen in Matthew is we have eight Beatitudes and have in Luke only four. What we have in, in Matthew is only eight blessings, but no curses. We have in Matthew, I'm sorry, in Luke, we have four blessings and four curses. So what you have is guys taking excerpts from different parts of Jesus' sermon and putting them into the text, in this case, Luke, and the other case, Matthew. And so nonetheless, uh, all that to say, this is probably just from the same sermon. And uh, so he highlights here, Luke does, four four blessings and four curses. And let's, let's read them together here if you're ready with me. Luke chapter 6, verse 20 through 26. And turning his gaze on his disciples, remember the disciples are different than the apostles. The apostles were disciples, but all, all the apostles were disciples, but not all disciples were apostles, okay? So there'd only be 12 apostles. There may be 200 disciples or more. Disciples are just simply followers of Jesus. He had a large entourage that followed him. And uh, hundreds, some, some true believers. Some are going to show up later in, in, in the biblical text as, as true believers. Names that are not mentioned among the apostles, but like a Barnabas or, or others who, who were part of, part of the group, but, but we don't know them otherwise. Luke, uh, uh, Mark, uh, these are not apostles. These are disciples. 
And then there's some of the disciples that aren't truly believers. They're following Jesus like Judas does to get something from him. And when Jesus doesn't produce, well, they turn their back on him. So anyway, so he turns to his disciples. So this is a large crowd, not necessarily the 12, in addition to the 12, I should say. And he began to say to them, blessed are you who are poor. Now, let me ask you something. Have you been poor before? Yeah, me too. Was that fun? Not necessarily. I, I like having more money as compared to not having any money. I mean, it's, you know, if I had to choose between the two, I'd rather not be poor. Jesus says you're blessed. And what is he talking about? Let's keep going. For yours is the kingdom of God. Well, if that's what it takes to get to the kingdom of God, then I'd rather be poor, wouldn't you? Blessed are you who are hungry. You ever been hungry? Every day, right? Right now, pastor, come on. We got, uh, tw- I, got, I got you for 40 minutes. You're going to make it. Uh, for you shall be satisfied, he says. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. Would, if, you, if, if you could choose in your history the days you were crying as opposed to the days you're laughing, which days would you choose? So how can he say that it's better to be crying than it is to be laughing? I don't get it. Or maybe you don't get it. Hopefully I get it here in a minute. I'll be able to explain it to you, God willing. Blessed are you when men hate you. I don't know about you, but I, I didn't, I've had some people that have had some problems with me, and I've had some problems back, and it was, I prefer to get along with people. I prefer to be accepted, and that's what he says here. Best of men who hate you and ostracize, kick you out, cast insults at you, and spurn your name as evil for the sake of the Son of Man. He's talking about himself. Be glad in that day. Leap for joy, he says, for behold, your reward is great in heaven, for in the same way your fathers used to treat the prophets. Hmm. But woe, now we've had four blessings, now here comes four woes or four curses. Woe to you who are rich. Uh Uh-oh, for you're receiving your comfort in full. This is all you're getting, he says. What does that mean? Woe to you who are well fed now, for you shall be hungry. The implication is forever. What do you laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep? Again, the implication is forever. What do you when men speak well of you, for in the same way their fathers used to treat the false prophets? Hmm. Interesting statements here, a complete opposite of our conventional thinking and wisdom in both in that day and in our day. So, so if I'm to read this literally, if I'm crying, I'm blessed, and if I'm laughing, I'm cursed? If I'm, if I'm poor, I'm rich, and if I'm rich, I'm poor. If I'm hungry, I'm filled, and if, I'm not, if I think I'm filled, then I'm hungry. Surely that's not what he meant, right? Well, for, let's start off with just a little biblical lesson of interpretation. Let him say what he says. Let the Bible say what it says. Don't immediately start saying, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, that's not what it means. Just don't do that. You and I are not smart enough for that. If Jesus says it, we take it for what it says, initially at least, because the Son of God who is the same one speaking here is the same one who spoke the entire creation into existence with a word. So when he says a word, when he's speaking about his kingdom and salvation, he's speaking with the same authority as when he spoke everything to existence. You follow me? The same authority that as when he spoke and demons left people and the sea calmed and uh, 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 people were healed, he speaks with the same authority when he speaks about his kingdom and salvation. So don't just sniff at this like it's some marginal statement or because it doesn't exactly agree with you think and, and, and even though he does mean what he says, it may not be exactly the way you're interpreting it. So let's make sure that, that we get it straight here. Jesus' teachings shatter both in and out the thinking and the processing and the wisdom of the day. They do. In fact, so much so that because of his teaching and because of his preaching, the people of the day, the teachers of the day, thought he was speaking from Satan. That's how opposite. So we are convinced you're from Satan. In fact, they kill him for it, right? He was so disturbing. Jesus and his teachings were so disturbing that they, they have to silence him. They kill him for it. So, so it's not unusual for us when we hear teachings of Jesus to chafe at it. In fact, it should be so. It, sh- it should so- be something that, that is pulling me back from what I thought I was supposed to be doing or pulling me back from the direction that, that I was going. It should be. It's okay to chafe under the teachings of Jesus. It's not okay to say, oh, well, this can't be true then. That's not okay. It, it, it's, it's, it's not okay to adjust the scriptures. It is okay to adjust yourself. So to be chafed and to be changed, well, great. So, so to the average person, 
this comes across as crazy teaching. I mean, so, so since when were poverty and hunger and sorrow and rejection a blessing? That, that's hard to understand. Since when was, was uh, 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 riches and satisfaction and happiness and popularity curses? Since, since when? It's totally contradictory to our experience on earth, is it not? Basically, everybody in the world lives to turn poverty into riches, don't we? Are we going around the world trying to eliminate poverty, trying to eliminate hunger? So what is Jesus saying? What does this mean? Aren't we about turning sorrow into happiness? Rejection into popularity? Well, precisely the point, the world's thinking and practice is exactly opposite of what really is going on. So we need to listen to this. We need to hear it. And and it boils down to just a simple question. Are you blessed or are you cursed? That's really what we need to know. Because he's given us four options here, right? To either be blessed or cursed. It's, it's one's in juxtaposition to the other. Either I'm blessed or a curse. And it, it's, not a, it's not unclear. People say, well, the Bible's not, not exactly clear. No, the Bible is crystal clear. It's you and I that muddy the waters. This is very clear. Four ways to be blessed. Four ways to be cursed. There's not a middle ground. There's not a neutral position. It's just either one or you're the other. And I want you to also understand this. They're, these are not wishes. They're not prayers that Jesus is making. These are absolutes. He's not saying, oh, Father, I pray that you would bless the poor or you'd bless the hungry. He's not saying that. He's saying they already are blessed or they already are cursed. They're, he's just making, a, making statements of absolutes. And so, again, the question comes back is how can this be? Well, let, let me just start off in helping us understand how, how hunger and, and uh, poverty and other things like that can, can be a blessing in a person's life. And let me say it this way, the desperate, let's hear it this way. So, so the four blessings, those, 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 four, those four blessings, the, 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 the poor and the hunger and the mourning and the rejected, these are categorizations of one, one, of one group, which is the desperate. These are desperate people, aren't they? So hear what Jesus is saying just just from that. Desperate people are blessed. Desperate people will wind up being blessed. It's not necessarily a categorization of of these things or those things. It's just a matter of the the desperateness. The desperate cry out to God. That's a blessing. No matter matter what got you desperate, it was a blessing. What what got you, by the way? What, What got a hold to your heart? What, what, what got you to the place where you got on your knees, it, whether physically or emotionally, spiritually, whatever it was, what got you on your knees so that you cried out to God? That was not fun, was it? Because, you know, it knocked, knocked the legs out from under you. But it turned out to be a blessing, didn't it? You see what I'm saying? This, it's, more, it's, not, it's not the physical things, and we're going to talk about that in just a second. It, it's what it gets you to. So, so, so hear it this way. The, the desperate are blessed and the self-sufficient are cursed. That's what he's saying. The ones who are self-satisfied and self-supplied and self-sufficient, they don't cry out to God. And so, by definition, by, by definition of that equation, they're not blessed. You never cried out to God. So, you know what? You missed out on what mattered in this life. Happiness, food, money, popularity, they're neutral things. You got those things, it doesn't matter. They're neutral. It's what you do with those things. See, if I'm using those things as, as an excuse to stay away from God, I'm happy, why do I need God? You see, that's a problem. That's the thinking of a cursed person. I have money, why do I need God? That's a cursed person. That person, if they continue that way, will remain cursed forever. I, I, I'm supplied, I take care of my own needs. Why would I cry out to God for my needs? You see, it's... It's, it's an understanding of there's something more than, well, I have money and I have food and I have a house and I have clothes to wear. It's more than understanding that. I mean, think about it. These, these things are not necessarily curses in themselves. Uh, some of the richest people in the world, King David, Abraham, Job, some of the richest people that ever lived were blessed people because they didn't allow it to be excuses to not come to God, you see. So, so, so they didn't let it stop their heart. They didn't let it stop the need that, that is within them. They didn't use it as an excuse of a fallen heart to keep them from God. So again, back to the simple, simple statement. The desperate, these are the ones that get blessed. And the self-sufficient, these are the ones that are going to be cursed. But again, the Bible is very crystal clear. 
We, we muddy the waters when we say, well, that's not what it means. What it means is this or what it means is that. And the Bible's real clear cut. Uh, either you're redeemed or you're not. Either you have been redeemed or you haven't been. There's no neutral ground. Either you're a child of God or you're a child of Satan. There's no neutral ground. There's no in between. There's not a third family to be a part of. You're either one family or the other. Either you're blessed or you're cursed. That's what Jesus is saying here. Either heaven is your home or if heaven is not your home, then hell is. It's one or the other. The Bible's not, not muddy. We muddy it when we start trying to, oh, well, that's not what it, what it really means is this and what it really, you know, all that stuff. Total waste of our time. So you can tell right up front, right away, whether a person is blessed or whether it's cursed, and it has to do with what they think of themselves. Do they, think, do they see themselves as a needy person who can't do anything without God? Or do they see themselves as a self-sufficient person who doesn't need God? That tells you automatically this is a blessed or a cursed person. And that's what simply Jesus is making up two lines here. He's saying two lines categorized by four different things, and you can tell by the, how they handle these things whether they're blessed, what they think about themselves and their circumstances, whether they're a blessed or a cursed person. So let's, let's take a look at these things. First, it starts off with poverty. Blessed are the, ble the blessing of poverty. Again, I ask the question, so you've been poverty before? Was that fun? Now, uh, we were, Val and I were talking about the difference between our income now and the income, and what we would make decisions on when we had no money. And we like it better to have money, frankly. It's just, you know, if we have to choose, uh, we like it that way. <laughs> I've been poor, I didn't like it all that much. I mean, I didn't know the difference, and now that I know the difference, I don't want to go back. How about that? Uh, I don't. Uh, you know, aren't we, again, going around the world to relieve poverty? So how, how is that a blessing? And poverty itself, listen, isn't necessarily a blessing. Just because you're, you're uh, poor doesn't mean you're going to be saved. Doesn't mean you're blessed. It's not a, it's not a oh, well, Jesus is going to save and rescue all the poor people. No, it's not what he's saying. That's not, it, the issue is, is not, a, it's not a physical condition. It's a spiritual condition. Look at what it says here, Matthew 5, 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, you see. You can have a load of money in the bank like Abraham did or, or David did or Job did, but you know that that's nothing. You know that your everything comes from God, you see. And, and, and so, so, so you can be fabulously wealthy, physically speaking, but poor in spirit, theirs is the kingdom of heaven, Jesus says. Theirs and no one else's. God, God doesn't bless people just because they're poor. Uh, don't, don't misread him here. People, when people understand that they're spiritually bankrupt, that they're spiritually in need, that they're spiritual beggars, the, 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 the word here for poor, both in Matthew and in Luke, is literally a person. It's the worst poverty there is. It's not just, you know, I'm poor, and so I'm standing on a street corner with a sign saying, we'll work for food, taking handouts. That's poor. That's poor. But that's not the poor that's here. Because that same guy or gal who's standing on the street corner is also smoking a cigarette, in my experience, and drinking, you know, a big thing of Dr. Pepper from Stripes down there. That, that's, that can be poor. I mean, in our society, that's poor. But that's not the poor that Jesus is being sp speaking of here. This poverty is a poverty of you have absolutely nothing. The word literally in the Greek is a picture word that refers to cringing. And the picture is, is of a person who is so poor, they're squatted down on a street corner with their hand out, hand, other hand over their eye, and they're just cringing, hoping someone will put anything in their hand. They're totally dependent upon someone else's kindness, and they have nothing else. That's the word. It's not like, well, I have a few things, but I need Jesus for everything else. That is not that word. That is still thinking that you're rich. The poverty here is an abject, complete poverty. They have nothing else. They're totally dependent upon him in every way. I can't buy my place in heaven. I can't buy it with my good deeds. I can't earn the right to be there. I am a complete beggar before God. I'm totally dependent upon his grace and mercy. That is the attitude of the blessed. That person will be forgiven will find salvation because God will make sure that he gets it to him or her. The blessed are not those who think they're spiritually rich. I'm a good person. I'm better than most. I find people, I ask questions all day. What, what makes you think you're going to go to heaven? I've been a good, good person all my life. That's the thinking of a cursed person. That's the thinking of a cursed person. 
And again, I didn't say that, Jesus does. That's the way a curse, unless they change, that person will be cursed forever. So blessing, the blessing of poverty, and then secondly, the blessing of hunger as opposed to being satisfied. Again, this is a spiritual thing, not a, not a physical thing per se. It's nothing wrong with having food, uh, but it, it's, it's an understanding, and, and Luke actually puts it this way, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. See, if I'm, I'm a spiritual beggar, you see, I also know that I, don't have, I can't gain the righteousness that God has for me. I'm totally dependent upon him giving it to me. So, so it's, an, it's an attitude. Again, you can know the blessed and the curse by how they think about themselves. Oh, I'm going to be fine. I'm going to tell Jesus to move over on his throne because I've become such a good person. That's the thinking of a cursed person. That's the way a cursed person thinks. That person is not going to get what they think. Or I should say, all they're getting is what they're getting here. This is the best they're ever going to have. Because from here on, it's going to be curses, to be sure. Matthew, again, records, the hunger, they hunger and thirst for righteousness. Who doesn't hunger and thirst for righteousness? Cursed people do. They don't. I don't need that. I don't need to go to church. I don't, I don't need to read the Bible. I don't need to pray. I don't need to depend on God. I'm fine the way I am. They're satisfied, you see. Self-satisfied. That's a cursed person. That's the way they think. Then, then the third one here, the blessing and the curse. Blessed, the blessing of weeping. And it's hard to be happy when you realize that you're a spiritual beggar and you hunger and thirst for righteousness. I mean, it's not sh- shocking that person is weeping. Of course they are. Because they're in a desperate situation. Again, blessed are the desperate, not the self-satisfied. Blessed are the desperate. Jesus, is in his statement here in Luke chapter 4, verse 18, this is in his own synagogue. This is the way he starts his ministry. He goes up to his hometown in Nazareth and goes to his home synagogue where he grew up as a little Jewish boy. The hometown boy coming with, into town with a lot of fame and they're hearing of all these miracles and all these teachings that he's done. And he takes out the book of Isaiah. We went over this back in Luke chapter 4 and he finds the place in Isaiah where it says this very thing, Isaiah 65, and he reads it. And when he finishes, he says, this, this day it's been fulfilled in your hearing. And after he did that, they took him out to the brow of the hill and they were going to throw him off, to kill him. What does it take for you to be so mad at your hometown boy that you want to kill him? Wow, that's... Especially when your, your, your town, the only claim to fame you have in Nazareth is that Jesus is from there. Because nobody else knows anything about Nazareth. It's just a, you know, a wide spot in the road. He, this is what he says. This is what makes him so mad, though. He says he's only coming for certain people, not for everybody. Look, look what he says. God, God anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. So if you don't think you're poor, Jesus isn't for you. The Messiah is not coming for me. What are you talking about? I'm, all this money tells the world that I'm blessed by God. What are you saying you're only here for the poor? Oh. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives. What are you talking about? We're a free men. We're, we're not captive to anyone. So I guess Jesus isn't for you then. Recovery of sight to the blind. I'm not blind. I can see. I know what's going on. I know what God's doing. Oh, really? Okay. Well, then now Jesus isn't for you. Set free those who are oppressed. I'm not oppressed. I don't need that. So he basically said, listen, the Messiah has come for these people, and if this is not who you are, then he's not here for you. They got very offended at that. I said, what does it take for you to want to kill your hometown boy? Well, that. That's right. He says, blessed are those who weep, for, as it says there, for they will laugh. What is that laughter? What's the laughter, listen, of being forgiven? That's where that laughter comes from. Uh, Of being released from captivity, of recovering your sight. That's where laughter comes from. That's where it comes from. And and those who laugh now think that they don't need those things. And they're cursed. They're cursed because they're self-satisfied. And then the final blessing, the blessing of rejection. And this is the one that's last on the list in order because it requires the previous three to be true for us. For, for, for me to be rejected means that I have to have been changed by the one who brings, I, I understand that I'm a spiritual uh, in poverty and that I am, am hungering and thirsting for righteousness that I can't get and I weep over the sick situation that I'm in and God rescues me. He pulls me out because that's what Jesus came to do, right? 
He came to relieve and to, and to rescue, and he's and recovered my sight. He's given me all these things, and so now what the work he's done in my life has changed me, and that change has become evident. And so, but now I'm still living in a world who I'm following Jesus. I'm believing what Jesus said, but the whole world, listen, hated what he said and killed him for what he said. So what does that mean for me? It means rejection. The blessing of rejection, it's almost like a mark. The fourth one here is how the world perceives us and it's like a mark uh, that heaven is blessing you when the world turns its back on you. Because if they accept you, it says the curse here, if they accept you, then, then that's what happens to curse people. I understand the world doesn't think right, and so they think that, that they're rich and when they're a cringing beggar and that they're, that they're uh, that hunger, uh, but they think they're filled and, and uh, uh, that they have every reason, we, although they have every reason to mourn, they see no reason except to laugh. And so when you're doing the opposite, well, they got a problem with that. The, the best way for me to understand it is if you think about the original murder in the Bible, which was between two brothers, Cain and Abel. Why did he kill his brother? You know, so Cain wants to do it this way and Abel wants to do it this way. Live and let live, right? We hear a lot of that today. Don't we hear a lot of live and let live? Okay, you believe this way, you follow this political party, you follow this kind of thinking. You can think what you think and I can think what I think and we can just live and let live. What's well, interesting that we're not doing that. Why is that? Because that never happens. It never does. Because here, here's what happens. The cursed will always hate the blessed. They just will. And it's not because you're special. So if you're among the blessed, awesome, praise God. And if the world hates you, listen, don't get all big-headed about it. Oh, I'm awesome because the world hates me. Well, no. They hate you because of whose you are, not because of who you are. Who you are, you're just like them. That's what makes them so mad. That's what made Cain so mad. What do you mean Abel is blessed and you accept his offering, you're not accepting mine, even though, of course, he, had, he knew just as much as Abel did, he just wanted to do it differently. And so, so Abel, for him, represents a constant reminder that he's doing it wrong. So what do I do? I get rid of the constant reminder. I snuff out the light. Jesus was the light of the world, right? He says, as long as I'm in the world, I'm the light of the world. What do they do with the light? They put it out. So now that he's resurrected and gone back into heaven, he now says that you're the light of the world. So guess what happens? So they were throwing rocks at the original light. What are they going to do with the other lights? Same thing. Shouldn't shock you. What are they going to do to those who understand and follow the truth? Look, look, at, look at Matthew. I think this is instructive. Matthew 10, 16, Jesus says, Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves, so be shrewd to serpents and innocent as doves. So, so is there truly a two different kinds of people in the world? Some are sheep, some are wolves. Is that true? No, actually it isn't. They're all sheep. Every single person out there, like, like sheep, remember our study? Sheep are stupid. Sheep can't defend themselves. Sheep can't provide for themselves. That is true for those who know that they're a sheep, and that is true for those who think they are not sheep. They think they're wolves. So, so it's as if they're wolves, because they're gonna attack you, because you as a sheep represent the fact constantly to them that they are wrong. What do you mean I'm a sheep? I'm not a sheep, I'm not a sheep. I, I've got it. I pulled my, I've made my way. It's because I was smart. That's the thinking of a cursed person. And that person will have a problem with you when you don't think like them. They just will. And, and the reason why they had that problem is because they had a problem with the original guy who thought that way, John 15. If the world hates you, Jesus speaking, you know that it, has also, it hated me before it hated you. You're, 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 a, you're a representative. We know that, right? You're the body of Christ, right? You're a representative of Christ of this world. We stand as, as his representative of this world. So it shouldn't shock us when they treat us just like they did him. Again, it's a mark that we're blessed. Look at, look at what uh, Colossians, this is Paul talking about the sufferings he was, has got, been going through on behalf of this church that he started there in Colossae. He says, now I rejoice in what I'm suffering for you. He's in prison at this point. He says, and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regards to Christ's afflictions 
So notice he says, they beat me and they put me in prison and they talk about me and they do all kinds of things against me, but it's not really me. It's the Jesus in me. It's the Jesus in me. For the sake of his body, he says, which is his church. We don't suffer necessarily on behalf of Christ. We suffer because of Christ. Because he's in you. Because you've chosen the other way, because you're actually living for the truth and you recognize your need and, and, and you recognize your desperate situation, the world doesn't want to hear that. They hate that. And so because you represent that, guess what? They hate you too. They just will. Every insult and persecution that comes to us was intended for Christ. And let me just say this clearly. They still hate and would kill him again if they could, if he were here. That's just the truth. The world has not changed. The heart has not changed. It's blessed or as cursed as they were then, so they are today. Okay, modernization, democracy, aren't we finding out these things can we just fall apart real quick? Great, great foundations started by wonderful fathers with great teachings and a wonderful country, and then all of a sudden, just poof, all of a sudden. Isn't that amazing? Because people are the problem. System's not the problem. It's the people determine the system. And, and because the people, hearts aren't changed, then the system falls apart. I want to ask if you would bow your heads and close your eyes with me as we think about what Jesus has said to us today. Blessings and curses. Where are you today? Where are you? I know if you're like me, you struggle every day with that dependence upon God. I, I know better, I know who I really am. But sometimes the stuff we have and the stuff that we are get in the way of our relationship with the Lord and we find that because we spend less time with him and less quality time with him. And so you and I, as Christians, we need to return to that dependence, return to that understanding of who we really are, brush aside all this stuff that he's blessed us with and get back to the realness, the the, the truthfulness of where our, really stance, our real stance is that we're beggars. We really are. That, that we're, we're, we're hungry and only he can supply it. That we weep because of our own sin, because of the sin of the world, and, and, and we accept the rejection that comes as a result of it. God, I thank you. I thank you that a humble heart is found by you. I thank you that a humble heart, you, you find them and, and you reach them with the truth. I thank you, God, that a desperate heart, a desperate heart is rescued. Or we're confident in that. We're confident that you're a God who, who does that and that you know the difference between the blessed and the cursed. And so, or we ask you to continually change us into all that you want us to be, to accept the rejection of the world if that's what it takes, whatever it is, Lord that you be glorified in us, that we be the light that you intended us to be. Thank you so much, Lord, for speaking to us today. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for visiting. Find us at www.islandbaptistchurch.org.